Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And on today's episode, we're going to kick off a brand new series talking about the Incarnation and Christmas and um, a lot of different things related to Christmas. It's going to be a a really good series. So today we're going to talk about the Incarnation. You know, the doctrine of the Incarnation is very important to biblical Christianity. The Incarnation, it reminds us that Jesus is both God and man, which makes it possible to speak meaningfully about who Jesus is and what he did in his death, burial, and resurrection. In the 19th century, James Denny, a professor at the United Free Church in Glasgow, Scotland, wrote the following on this matter. He says, Christ is the only person who can do this work, salvation for us. He says, this is the deepest and most decisive thing we can know about him. And in answering the question, which it prompts, we are starting from a basis and experience. There is a sense in which Christ confronts us as the reconciler. He is doing the will of God on our behalf, and we can only look on. We can see him in judgment and the mercy of God, he says, in relation to our sins. His presence and work on earth are a divine gift, a divine visitation. He is a gift of God to men, not the offering of men to God, and God gives himself to us in and with him. We owe to him all that we call divine life. On the other hand, this divine visitation is made, and this divine life is imparted through a life and work in which are truly human, he says. The presence and work of Jesus in the world, even the work of bearing sin, does not prompt us to define human and divine by contrast with each other. There is no suggestion of incongruity between them. Nevertheless, they are both there. Add the fact that they are both there justifies us in raising the question, he says, as to Jesus' relation to God on the one hand and to men on the other. So we must ask, what is the function of the incarnation in biblical Christianity? A classic statement on why Jesus has become man, and its answer is found in Anselm of Canterbury's theological masterpiece, Curus Deus Homo, or Why Did God Become Man? This book deals with the question of the incarnation. And Anselm stated that God became man in Christ alone because only one who is both a truly God and truly man can achieve our salvation. The incarnation, Jesus taking on a fully human state, it shows us that God has not abandoned us. That's good news but rather loves and values us even in our fallen state. Now, the the clip that I'm going to play for you next is a portion of a sermon from a message, Why the God-Man, by Sinclair Ferguson from Light and Heat, A Passion for the Holiness of God, from their 2011 uh, conference by the same title. Let's take a listen here, uh, or watch, if you're watching, uh, what Sinclair has to say to us now. Here's our problem. We are not amazed by the question, why the God-man? We assume, of course, He would come. The gospel begins to amaze us when we learn who it is who has come. It's staggering to the intellect. Indeed, I think one can say, if your intellect has never been staggered by the reality of the incarnation, you don't know what incarnation means. It doesn't mean Jesus was a little baby. It means the eternal, infinite, divine one, worshipped by cherubim and seraphim, creator of all things, sustainer of all things infinite in His being, wisdom, power, majesty, glory, who at a word could dissolve the world that had sinned against Him, was willing to come into this world and assume our flesh in order to become our Savior. 
It's overwhelming. That's the great thing about the gospel, isn't it? It's never done overwhelming you. Wave upon wave upon wave of worship and adoration that God the Son should come for the likes of me. And not just because it's the likes of me, because it's the one who is without parallel in infinite majesty who has done that. Well, it wasn't that clip really good. Well, you know, we need to continue on understanding that the atonement is the reason uh, God came as a man. Consider the following scriptures with me. Hebrews 10, 4 through 7 says this, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written of me in the scroll of the book. Hebrews 10, 10 says, and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Matthew 1, 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus spoke of his coming suffering, thus demonstrating his foreknowledge of the events. Mark eight thirty one says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. Mark 9.31 says, For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. He linked the success of his mission to the crucifixion. In John 12.32 it says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. In several places in John's gospel, the crucifixion is spoken of as that vital hour for which Christ came. So the death of Jesus is also a major theme throughout the Old Testament. First in regard to the meaning of the sacrifices, the meaning of the heart of the law, then in regard to the prophecies which focused increasingly on the promise of a coming Redeemer. Isaiah 53 and even other Old Testament texts, they speak of the suffering of the Deliverer to come. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul teaches that even Abraham, who lived before both the law and the prophets, was saved by faith in the Lord Jesus in Galatians 3.8 and Galatians 3.16. Furthermore, Jesus told the downcast disciples on the Emmaus Road that the Old Testament foretold his death and resurrection. Luke 24, 25 through 27 says this, And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So, in light of these texts and many others, we can acknowledge that the atonement of Christ is the primary reason for the incarnation. It is the explanation of the twofold nature of Jesus and the focal point of the world and of biblical history. Now, we must ask the question, is the doctrine of the atonement central to the word of God? Why must Jesus, the God man, be the one to provide salvation? In the Institutes of Christian Religion, John Calvin argues that this is how God has chosen to do it, and therefore it is impertinent of us to ask if there could not be some other way. Salvation, you see, had to be achieved by God, for no one else could achieve it. Certainly men and women could not achieve it without him, for we are the ones who have gotten ourselves into trouble in the first place. After all, we're sinners by nature and by choice. We have done so by our rebellion against God's righteous law and his just decree. We have suffered the effects of sin to such a degree that our will is bound, and therefore we cannot even choose to please God, let alone actually please Him. And if we are to be saved, only God has the power to save and must save us. First, it is God who initiates salvation for man. Now, if this is forgotten, it's easy to think of God as somehow remote from the atonement and therefore merely requiring it as some abstract price to satisfy his justice. Now, in that view, God appeared disinterested, legalistic, and cruel. In actuality, God's nature is characterized by love, and it is out of love that he planned and even carried out the atonement. 
Now, through Jesus Christ, God himself was satisfying his own justice. Now, it's easy to see why the incarnation and the atonement must be considered together if each part is not to be distorted. Secondly, there is no suggestion that human beings somehow placate the wrath of an angry God. Propitiation does refer to the placating of wrath, but it is not man who placates God. Rather, it is God placating his own wrath so that his love might go out to embrace and fulfill fully save the repentant sinner. A proper recognition of the connection between the incarnation and the atonement makes the incarnation understandable. And at the same time, it eliminates the most common misunderstandings of and objection to Christ's sacrifice of himself as a means of salvation. The divine son, one of the three persons within the trinity of the one God, is he through whom, from the beginning of creation, the father has revealed himself to man, according to John 1.18. He took man Man's nature upon himself and so became our representative. He offered himself as a sacrifice in our stead, bearing our sin in his own body on the tree. He suffered not only uh, awful physical anguish, but also the unthinkable spiritual horror of becoming identified with the sin to which he was infinitely opposed. He thereby came under the curse of sin so that for a time, even his perfect fellowship with his father was broken. Thus, God proclaimed his infinite abhorrence of sin by being willing himself to suffer the cross in place of the guilty in order that he might forgive us. Thus, the love of God found its perfect fulfillment because he did not hold back from even that utmost sacrifice in order that we might be saved from eternal death through what he endured. Finally, it was possible for him to be just and to justify the believer because as a lawgiver and as a substitute for the rebel race of man, he himself suffered the penalty of the broken law. Now, there are several explanations that fall from the foundation that I've built on regarding the doctrine of the incarnation. First, according to the scriptures, Calvary is the center of biblical Christianity. Many consider the incarnation to be the most important thing about Christianity. In other words, they consider God identifying himself with man the most important and consider the atonement as something of an afterthought. According to the Bible, the reason for the God-man is that it required just such a person to die for our salvation. Jai Packer said, The crucial significance of the cradle at Bethlehem lies in its place in the sequence of steps down that led the Son of God to the cross of Calvary. And we do not understand it till we see it in that context. So to focus on the incarnation apart from the cross, it leads to false sentimentality and neglect of the horror and the magnitude of human sin. Second, if the death of Christ on the cross is a true meaning of the incarnation, and I, and I believe it is, as the word of God says, then there is no gospel without the cross. Christmas, or the birth of Jesus by itself, is no gospel. The life of Christ alone is also no gospel. Even the resurrection, important as it is, in the total scheme of things, is no gospel by itself. The good news is not just that God became a man, nor that God has spoken to reveal a proper way of life to us. The good news is not even our great triumph over that great enemy we call death. Rather, the good news is that sin has been dealt with. The resurrection, after all, is proof of this, that Jesus has suffered its penalty for us as our representative head so that we might never have to suffer it. And therefore, all who believe in him can look forward to heaven. The other biblical themes must be seen in this context as we've already seen of the incarnation. Emulation of Christ's life in teaching is only possible to those who enter into a new relation with God through faith in Jesus Christ as their substitute. The resurrection is not merely a victory over death, but a proof that the atonement was a satisfactory atonement in the sight of the Father, according to Romans 4.25, and that death, the result of sin, is abolished on that basis. Now, any gospel that talks merely of the Christ event, meaning the incarnation without the atonement, is a false gospel. Any gospel that speaks about the love of God without pointing out that his love led him to pay the ultimate price for sin on the cross is a false gospel. The only true gospel is the one of the one mediator, according to 1 Timothy 2, 5-6, who gave himself for us. 
Finally, just as there can be no gospel without the atonement as a reason for the incarnation, so also there can be no Christian life without it. Without the atonement, the incarnation, it becomes a kind of deification of the human and leads to arrogance and self-advancement. Now, with the atonement, the true message of the life of Christ and therefore of the life of the Christian man or woman, it's humility and self-sacrifice for the obvious needs of others. The Christian life is not indifference to those who are hungry, sick, or suffering, from so of the lack. It is not contentment with our own abundance, neither the abundance of middle class living with homes, cars, clothes, and vacations, nor is it satisfaction with the abundance of, you know, education or even the abundance of good churches, Bibles, biblical teaching, or Christian friends or acquaintances. Rather, it is the awareness that others lack these things and that we must therefore sacrifice many of our own interests in order to identify with them and thus bring them increasingly into the abundance that we enjoy because of Christ. Paul writing on the incarnation in 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Also in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, he says, Have this mind among yourself, which is your, yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, Paul says, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is a strong reminder that we as Christians must emulate Christ in every way. Now, Philippians 2, 5 through 11 also describes the ultimate example of humble service. Jesus left his throne and became like us in order to serve us. This passage is often referred to as the hymn of Christ. In these verses in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, Christ's example of service is depicted through a stirring poem that traces his pre-existence, his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, even his ascension to the right hand of God. Paul wrote this magnificent theology to encourage the Philippians to consider other people's interests first. Verse 4, Jesus is the paradigm of genuine spiritual progress, not a self-aggrandizing struggle for supremacy, but a deep love for God and neighbor shown in deeds of service. Verses 6 through 11 of Philippians 2 have some clear indications of poetic structure, leading some to believe that this is a pre-Pauline hymn adapted by Paul. It is just as likely, however, that Paul composed the hymn for this setting under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In view of the myriad of theological questions that arise in these verses, it is critical to keep two things in mind. First, these verses were written not to spur Christians to theological debate, but to encourage greater humility and love. Second, the summary of Christ's life and ministry found here is not unique to the book of Philippians. The same things are evident throughout the entire New Testament. So prior to the incarnation, Christ was in the form of God. Now, despite assertions of some scholars to the contrary, the most uh, naturally refers, I mean, to the pre-existence of Christ. He, the eternal son, was there with the father before he was born in Bethlehem. Form here in Philippians 2 means the true and exact nature of something or possessing the characteristics and qualities of something. Therefore, having the form of God is roughly equivalent to having a quality with God. And it is directly in contrast with having the form of a servant according to Philippians 2.7. So form could also be a reference to Christ being the ultimate image of God, the exact imprint of his nature, according to Hebrews 1.3. It might also refer to the fact that he is the visible expression of God's invisible glory, according to Colossians 1.15. Remarkably, Christ did not imagine that having equality with God, which he already possessed, should lead him to hold on to his privileges. It was not something to be grasped, but to be kept and exploited for his own benefits or advantage. Instead, he had a mindset for service. Christ did not plead himself, according to Romans 15.3. In humility, he counted the interest of others as more significant than his own, according to Philippians 2.3-4. through 4. 
made himself nothing, has occasioned much controversy. The Greek word kaneo can mean empty, pour out also, or also, I mean, metaphorically give up status and privilege. Now, does this mean that Christ temporarily relinquished his divine attributes during his earthly ministry? Well, absolutely not. The theory of Christ's kenosis or self-emptying is not in accord with the context of Philippians or with early Christian theology. Paul is not saying that Christ became less than God or even gave up some of his divine attributes. He is not even commenting directly on the question of whether Jesus was fully um, all-powerful and all-knowing during his time on earth, nor is he saying that Christ ever gave up being in the form of God. And this is really important because you'll often hear false teachers make this kind of statement and argument that Christ uh, doesn't somehow uh, ha- isn't truly God and truly man and that uh, he emptied or he poured out himself that that's the stakes that we're talking about here and this is what Paul is talking about and this is why we must learn and and even grow in our skill and handling of the word of God as second Timothy 2 15 uh, says so let's continue on Paul is stressing in Philippians 2 that Christ, who had all the privileges that were rightly his as king of the universe, gave up uh, to become an ordinary Jewish baby bound for the cross. In other words, he came to die. Christ made himself nothing by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And while he had every right to stay comfortable where he was in a position of supreme uh, power and authority, his love, you see, drove him to a chosen position of weakness for the sake of sinful men. 2 uh, Corinthians 8, 9 says, Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. In other words, the emptying consisted of his becoming human, not of his giving up any part of his true deity. Now, it's remarkable enough that God would take on human form or an outward appearance, form, shape, a different term for morphate used in Philippians 2, 6 through 7 for form of God and form of servant and thus enter into all the mess of a fallen world. But Jesus went much further than just condescension. He also became obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross, according to Romans 5, 19. Crucifixion was not simply a convenient way of executing prisoners. It was the ultimate ultimate indignity, a public statement by Rome which said that the crucified one was beyond contempt. The excruciating physical pain was magnified by the degradation and humiliation of the person. No other form of death, no matter how prolonged or physically agonizing, could match crucifixion as an absolute destruction of the person. The cross was the ultimate counterpoint to the divine majesty of the pre-existent Christ, and thus was the ultimate expression of Christ's obedience to the Father. And so Jesus' humiliation and humble service became the foundation for his exaltation. By humbling himself on the cross out of love, he demonstrated that he truly shared the divine nature of God who is love, according to 1 John 4, 8. For this reason, God raised him to life and highly exalted him, entrusting him with the rule of the cosmos and giving him the name that is above every name. In the Septuagint, God's personal name is translated as Kyrios, which means Lord, which is the the name specified in Philippians 2.11. Paul indicated that the eternal Son of God received a status and an authority that had not been his before he became incarnate as truly God and truly man. The fact that Jesus received this name is a sign that he exercises his messianic authority in the name of Yahweh. Now, while Christ now bears the divine name Yahweh, Hebrew for Lord, he is still worshipped with his human name, Jesus. The astounding union of Jesus' divine and human natures is reinforced by Isaiah 45, 23 in the words, every knee should bow and every tongue confess, which refers exclusively to Yahweh in Isaiah 45, 24. The fact that these words can now be applied to God's messianic agent, Jesus Christ, Christ the Lord, it shows that Jesus is truly divine. He is truly God. 
Now, the worship of Jesus as Lord is not the final word of the hymn in Philippians 2. Jesus' exaltation also results in the glory of God the Father. This identical pattern is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28. When God gives Jesus messianic dominion over all creation and declares that everyone will one day rightly give praise to him as their Lord. In this passage, we learn that when Jesus' kingdom reaches its fullness, he does not keep the glory for himself. Instead, 1 Corinthians 15, 28 says, the son himself will also be subjected to him who puts all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. So even in his exaltation, Jesus remains the model of loving service to God. Now, throughout this episode, we've examined what the Word of God says about the Incarnation and what influential theologians have said about it. The Incarnation is vital to a robust understanding of the Gospel, as we've seen in this episode. In the Incarnation, God became a man and was born from a virgin in Bethlehem. Above all, the Incarnation proves to man that God is not disinterested in the affairs of sinners, but rather He came to deal with the problem of man's sin. The doctrine of the Incarnation, it demonstrates that that God doesn't simply just talk a big game, but actually offers a solution to man's problem of sin. God, in his love, sent Jesus into the world. Jesus lived a sinless life as a man, all the while experiencing all the temptation that mankind faces. And yet, he lived a sinless life in the midst of people who constantly criticized him while begging him for miracles. The people during Christ's ministry spit in his face and ridiculed him. But all the while, Jesus demonstrated that he cared for people by teaching, by healing, by setting the captives free, by raising the dead, and so much more. All of this disproves the modern notion that God is not interested in man. By becoming a man, God demonstrated that he was interested in mankind through his willingness to step into our time and into our space and to die for our sins. So when we consider the doctrine of the incarnation, let us worship the God of the Bible, the creator of all, and the redeemer of sinners, who is indeed worthy and alone is worthy at that, of all praise, of all honor, and of all glory. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of the Equip You and Grace podcast. Until next time, may God bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.